It's great, isn't it, that we can come together like this and uh, uh, just encourage ourselves and one another in the Lord, build each other up. And uh, I do understand there's, there's lunch afterwards, so do stay behind and uh, have some fellowship with us and some lunch with us after the meeting. Amen. Okay. Um, yes, we're starting a new series this morning in the Gospel of John. And um, it will be a long series. Um, so he that endures to the end will be saved. Um, it might be the longest series I've ever done. So if the Lord puts something else upon my heart during this series, then of course we'll just take a break and deal with that and then come back to this series afterwards. So the series I've called Eternal Life Through Believing in Jesus, which I believe to be the main theme of John's Gospel. And this particular session is entitled Let the Witnesses Testify. Now, whenever you study a book in the Bible, whether it's a, a gospel or one of the epistles or whatever it is, it's always important to ask, what is this about? What's, what's the purpose of this book? What's the context? And uh, thankfully, John lets us know why he wrote this epistle, uh, this gospel. And um, we read that in, um, if I can just, uh, we read that, there you go, in John chapter 20 and verse 31. The gospel was written for the specific purpose that we might believe that our faith might have a focal point that we can rest upon and be established upon. And that's, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. John says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Amen. So belief is a major theme in John. In fact, the word occurs 98 times in the Greek, which is quite remarkable for a book this size. 98 times we're exhorted to believe, to have faith, to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in this chapter, uh, we're reading about John the Baptist, who was the forerunner to Jesus. And he said, this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So you get the picture. John is writing this so that we might, he might build our faith, encourage our faith to center and focus upon Jesus. Now, what is it he wants us to know? Let's just go back to that verse in John chapter 20, verse 31. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, so Matthew, Mark and Luke were all focused on what Jesus taught and what he did, but John focuses on who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. Now this is important. He is the Son of God. The Son of God became the Son of Man, so that sons of men might become sons of God. This is the glory of the gospel, and in fact, you will appreciate the gospel more as you understand who Jesus is. Amen? You will see the glory of the gospel in the glory of the Son himself. So right from the beginning then, John speaks about the deity of Christ. He says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Amen. So he's referred to, Jesus the Son of God is referred to as the Word. Or it's the Logos is the Greek word. So to the Greeks, the Logos, or the Word, was the mind of God controlling the world and everyone and everything in it. God brought everything into existence through the Word. God sustains and upholds all things by the Word of His power. And Jesus is the Logos, the Word. So to the Jews also, this had great significance. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is referred to as the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and last letter of the alphabet. In other words, Jesus is the sum total of what God wants to say to this world. That's why Jesus is so important. That's why we preach nothing but Jesus here. 
because he is God's message. The Bible says that God in these last days has spoken to us through his son. Amen. So we just preach Jesus because that's God's message to the world. Why? Because Jesus has come to reveal the Father to us. He said in this chapter, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now that phrase declared is a very expressive term in the Greek. It means he's explained him. Jesus has come to explain this is what the Father is like. Amen. You know, it's the same word that was used um, when the two disciples were on the road to Emmaus. And you know what happened? It was a, just a beautiful time for them. Jesus drew alongside them and, and calmed them down and began to expound from the scriptures, beginning with Moses and the prophets, all things concerning himself. And then he broke the bread and their eyes were opened and they saw him in the breaking of the bread. And then the Bible says that when they reach their destination, they explain these things, they declare these things. So that wasn't just like a, a quick summary. They went into detail. They unfolded these things to the others. That's the meaning of that word. Jesus has come to explain the Father, to show us what the Father is like. So any other image we have that is not consistent with the person of Jesus revealed in the Gospels is a false image. Amen. Now, let's go back to this then. In the beginning, in the beginning, the word existed, Jesus existed, or, or the Son of God existed before creation or time. Jesus said at the end of his ministry, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Amen. So before anything was there, Jesus was there. The Son of God was there. The, the Logos was there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now that verse, or those two verses set forth two powerful doctrines, okay? The doctrine of the deity of Christ, that Jesus is fully God. Amen. Co-equal, co-eternal with the Father, fully God. But it also tells us about the Trinity. There's more, more than one person in the Godhead. The, the word was God and the, the word was with God. Okay. So that talks about the Trinity. So John's logic is this. this. There is a being known as the word or the logos. This being is called God, yet at the same time is distinct from the Father. Okay, now Martin Luther says this, the word of God is against Arius, I'll explain this in a minute, and the word was with God is against Sibelius. What does that mean? There were, there were false teachings that started to come into the church after the New Testament age, okay? The first one was called Arianism, named after this man Arius. And he taught that Jesus is not God. Jesus was a created being. He was the greatest created being, he said, but still nonetheless, he had a beginning. He was created by the Father. Now that's a wrong teaching. That's the teaching that is taught by the Jehovah's Witnesses today. And so we have to stand against that. We have to, we have to be educated against, you know, why this is wrong. Because what it's saying is that God used a created being to save other created beings who had fallen. That is not the same. Only God could save us. God had to step into humanity himself, become a man, become one of us, take upon himself human nature, live as a man, though he was still fully God, fully man at the same time, and die in our place. Only God could redeem us. Amen. Salvation is of the Lord. He didn't send another created being to do the job. He came. God with us. That's what Jesus is called. Emmanuel. God with us. Amen. So this guy called Arius taught that he was a created being. And another man called Athanasius was raised up by God to refute that from the scriptures to show that Jesus was fully God, co-equal, co-eternal with the Father. But then there was another false teacher called Sibelius. And he taught that there was not a, 
there were not three persons in the Trinity. There was only one person. And so sometimes that person uh, presented as the Father. And then he presented as the Son. And then he presented as the Holy Spirit. But there's only one person. Now that's not what the scripture says. It says here, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Twice it says that the Son was with God. Amen? And of course the Holy Spirit is also uh, divine as well. And so these, two, these doctrines are refuted. Now, why do we do that? Because there are people that teach this today and we need to be on our guard. We don't like to talk a lot about doctrine in this sense and on Sunday morning, but it's important to be equipped so that when the Jehovah's Witnesses knock at your door, you are ready for them. You will be their worst nightmare. <laughs> Amen? Amen. It says all things were made through him. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made, right? So the word created all things that were created. Therefore, he himself is an uncreated being. He didn't create himself. It says very clearly, everything that's made was made by him. Everything that was created. So Jesus could not be a created being because everything that was made was made by him. Amen. Paul says the same thing, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, it says that God is said to have created all things. Okay, then in this verse, Christ is said to have created all things. So what's the conclusion? Christ is God. Amen. The Word is God. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Now, I just want to uh, share this with you. We don't like to get bogged down with the cults, but just so that you know where they are coming from and where they came to that conclusion. In the Jehovah's Witnesses translation of the Bible, it reads like this, this verse that we're looking at. In the beginning, the Word was, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. You see? A God. Now, why do, they do, why do they say that? They say uh, the claim of the Watchtower Society defending their translation of John 1, 1 to 2 is that because before the second time God is used in this passage, no article or definite article appears. So it does, it, in other words, it's God, not the God. It could be any God. So they've taken the liberty of just inserting A. And then they quote two Greek authorities to support them, to make them appear to agree with their translation. These men are Dr. Julius Manti and Johannes Greber. Now in response to that, let's just have a look. In these passages, I'm not going to read all those, but you, you, if, if you want to go back and look at them up in your Bible, they translated the same grammar for God as God, not a God. So it suited their purpose to translate John 1, 1 and 2 as a God, but they are not consistent. Every other time that appears, they just translate it as it is, God. Amen? I hope you understand what I'm saying there. And then secondly, the, the, the Greek authorities that they quote, they actually misquoted. One of them, Dr. Manti, even wrote to the Watchtower when he saw that they had quoted him out of context and demanded that his name be removed. From the, from the book that they wrote. This is what he said. It's a grossly misleading translation. It is neither scholarly nor reasonable to translate John 1, 1 as the word was a God. But of all the scholars in the world, so far as we know, none have translated this verse as Jehovah's Witnesses have done. So in other words, they've really basically brutalized this verse without any, any foundation scholarly wise. The other scholar quoted in their book, the word who is he according to John is Johannes Greber. Now Greber was actually an occult practicing spiritist, not a Greek scholar. <laughs> so, so therefore we don't have to take a lot of notice of him. Now let's just quote some other Greek scholars that did that do know what they're talking about. First of all, Dr. Charles Feinberg says, I can assure you that the rendering which the Jehovah's Witnesses give 
of John 1.1 1, 1 is not held by any reputable Greek scholar. Dr. Paul Kaufman, who I've had the pleasure of meeting, by the way, he said this, that the Jehovah's Witness people evidence an abysmal ignorance of the basic tenets of Greek grammar in their mistranslation of John 1.1. 1, 1. And Dr. William Barclay, a well-known uh, New Testament scholar, said this, the way the JWs have translated this verse is grammatically impossible. It is abundantly clear that a sect which can translate the New Testament like that is intellectually dishonest. You see, it's important that we, we stand for sound doctrine and refute these, these, these errors. Every single book in the New Testament, apart from one, I think it's Philemon, speaks about false teachers and false teaching that will come into the church to try to pervert the truth. So we are called upon to, to rightly divide the word of God and, and to speak against these things. And uh, why is it important? As I said, because only God could come into our world and save us. Only God who is infinite, whose death would have infinite value and, and impact that could save the whole world if they believe in him. And that was, of course, God manifest in the flesh through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now it goes on to say, in him was life and the life was the light of of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it or overcome it is the word there so the logos is the power which creates life and maintains all life in existence amen the logos is the source of all life on earth and that word translated life is zoe You've heard that word many times, Zoe, which means the life principle. Not bios, which is mere biological life, but what, what do we mean by Zoe? It means a life as possessed by the one who gave it, which has the power to reproduce according to its kind. Now, this is a wonderful thing, the miracle of life itself on planet Earth. Every life form, whether it's the fish that swim in the seas or the rivers, whether it's the birds that fly in the air, the trees and the forest, the flowers in the garden, the animals that stalk the earth, whether it's human beings, every life form has power to bring forth after its kind. And so perpetuate life on planet earth. Where did this come from? This came from Jesus, the Son of God. In him was life. This didn't come from some single cell amoeba, you know, wobbling about in some slimy pool that suddenly, wow, look at all this that's around us. That was quite incredible, wasn't it? No, this came from God, the Son. Amen? In Him was life. And it goes on to say, and the life was the light of men. How is Christ as the life, the light of men? Well, every human being is morally enlightened. We have what we call a conscience. We are made accountable. How do we get a conscience? Well, God didn't actually create us with a conscience. He created us and said, just don't touch that tree there, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you eat that, you will die. So how were we supposed to know good and evil? By relating everything to God. Only God can say what is good and what is evil. So we were meant to know good and evil by our relationship with God. Amen. But man, as we know, partook of the forbidden fruit. And then when that happened, he got a conscience. He was given a conscience that was like a moral light shining in him so that he knew what was right and what was wrong. And of course, as, as, uh, as the word of God develops and God called out the nation of Israel, he gave them the word of God, which fed that conscience and, and, and informed that conscience correctly so that the light of God was shining more upon the Jewish race at that time than all the other nations because they had the word of God. But what about the other nations, the Gentiles? Well, this is what Paul says about them. When the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and uh, between themselves, their thoughts accusing or excusing them. 
Every nation has a, has a, you know, a moral understanding of what is right and what's wrong. It's wrong to murder, it's wrong to steal, and all those sort of things. And they know what's right and what's wrong. It's written on their heart. They don't have the same revelation as uh, the Jews had because of the word of God. But nevertheless, the same law is written upon their hearts. And the Bible, in fact, Paul says in Romans 1 that, that having this light, that they, they try to suppress it. They try to put it out. They try to hold it down as the meaning so that they could just make their own rules up. And then we're finding this today, of course, calling right wrong and wrong right. And everyone's confused about what, you know, which way is up now. It's just, it's just crazy. But, but the fact is that God gave this light to every human being that comes into the world. So though enlightened by Christ, the natural man has switched this light off. Why? Because it says in John that he loved darkness rather than light. Amen. But this is the good news that John is bringing through the gospel. Even though man has turned the light off, God doesn't just walk away. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. How does it shine? Through the gospel. Let's read on. The darkness of the fallen human race did not extinguish the light. In fact, it shines even more bright through the gospel. Paul says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts, us believers, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the love of God. Even though man suppressed the light, tried to turn the light off and shut it down, God sent Jesus into the world with the gospel so that the gospel could shine into our hearts again and the light be turned on again. Hallelujah. Now, we come to John the Baptist, where um, John says this, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness to the light that all through him might believe. Now we know him as John the Baptist, but he's repeatedly presented to us as a witness to Jesus, the one who is to witness to Jesus. This is the light. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, to point him out, as it were. And um, you ask, well, why, why, why would you need to point out the light? When the sun is shining, in all its beauty, who needs to be told it's shining? The answer is the blind. The blind. And, and that's how mankind is now. And it's fallen state. It's spiritually blind. And so he has to be told that the light was now in their midst. So God sent John to bear witness of the light. God would not allow his beloved son to come into the world unheralded. Amen. He sent a, a, you know, a forerunner to proclaim his coming, to herald his coming, and even to point him out so that there could be no mistake when he came. So the matter of a witness is a serious thing, establishing truth and giving ground for faith. Now remember that John's purpose here is that we might believe, to give us a foundation to believe. Now, if you go to court to present a case, you can present the evidence and so on, but what do you have to do eventually? Call forth the witnesses, amen? And it's usually in the mouth of two or three witnesses that everything would be established. If there are two or three good witnesses, that should be enough. So we're going to look at the witness. In fact, there were eight witnesses uh, that, that the Bible speaks about. And the first one, of course, was Jesus himself. Jesus testified of himself. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I came from and where I'm going. Now, it's important we start with Jesus because if Jesus did not say that he was the Son of God, we might as well stop right there. Amen? But he did. That's the whole point. Uh, C.S. Lewis, I like his quote, is often uh, referenced. C.F. Lewis, Lewis said this, you know, some people say, uh, you know, Jesus is not the Son of God, but he was a good man. 
And he says, you can't say that. You can't say that. If he's not the son of God, he's a liar. He's a deceiver. Don't have anything to do with him. You know, he said, and he said, this, these are the three options. He's either a lunatic. In other words, he was deranged, making these outrageous claims about himself. Or he's a liar, deliberately set about to deceive us. Or he's Lord. They're the only choices. You either believe him. If you believe him, you can't believe him as a, a man who set a good example and a man that we should follow if he's not the son of God because he lied. Amen? But he didn't lie. That's the whole point. <laughs> In fact, you know, the, the Jews were going to stone him for this. He said, why, why are you stoning me? What works are you going to stone me for? He said, no, no, none of the works, but because you called yourself the son of God, making yourself equal with God. Now, if Jesus wanted to save his life and save his neck, he would just say, oh, no, no, hang on a minute, you're mistaken. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that at all. But he didn't, because that's what he was saying. I am the son of God. I am the light of the world. And I am sent from my father to you. So first of all, it's very clear. Jesus bore witness to himself that he is the son of God. Then, of course, we've, we've seen that John the Baptist bore witness. Now, that's important because the scriptures said that one would come who would prepare the way and who would point him out when he came. Uh, Malachi said that 400 years before Jesus. Uh, he was called, the, you know, the, the, the one that would prepare the way before the messenger of the Lord. And then you go back another 200 years to Isaiah. And uh, Isaiah predicted that he would become as the voice crying in the wilderness. We know that's, that's John the Baptist saying, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So John the Baptist was a witness. He was foretold that he would be here as a witness. That was his only job. His main job was to point out Jesus. When Jesus came, he said, he must increase. I must decrease. I've done my job. He's here now. You know, he's here. I pointed him out. And, and so he was a witness. And then, of course, the father was a witness. Jesus said, and the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. When did he testify? When he was baptized. You remember? Many people heard him. When Jesus was baptized and came up out of the water, heaven opened and God spoke audibly from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. And, and again, the disciples, three of them anyway, uh, Peter, James and John, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was transfigured, you know, Peter didn't know what to say. What should we do? Should we build three tabernacles? Jesus said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Listen to him. Amen. He, the father bore witness. And greatly, uh, most of, you know, great, uh, the greatest witness, if you like, that the father gave of Jesus is when he raised him from the dead. Now, if Jesus was a liar, a deceiver, and... Um, was not the son of God, did not, you know, um, measure up to the claims that he made, the father would never have raised him from the dead. But by raising him from the dead, he endorsed him, bore witness to Jesus. As Jesus said there, I am the one who bears witness of myself and the father who sent me bears witness of me. Well, let's go on. His works, his works bore witness to him. Jesus said, I have greater witness than John for the works the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. I mean, the works of Jesus were, were amazing. In fact, even one of, one of the Pharisees, Nicodemus, came to him and his, his opening words were, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Why? Because no one can do the works that you do, unless God has sent him. No one can do it. He did things that nobody else has done. No, Jesus said, if, if I had not done works that no, no other person had done, they would have been without excuse. But because he had come and done works that nobody else had done. I mean, he turned the water into wine at that wedding. Just imagine that. Everyone saw the water going into the pots and Jesus turned the water into the best wine. He took five loaves and two fishes and fed 5,000 men plus women and children and had 12 baskets of food left over. Wow. And only the Son of God can do that. Amen. He walked on water. 
He opened the eyes of a blind man. Nobody did ever opened the eyes of someone who was born blind from birth. Jesus did. He raised the dead. Amen. And he did many other things that bore witness to the fact that he's the son of God. And then the scriptures. He challenged his opponent. He said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. They be a witness to me. For if you had believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And, and so from Genesis to the end of the Bible, it's all about Jesus. It's all about you. He's the theme. He's the message. We see him in the types. We see him in the shadows. We see him, you know, in, in the prophecies and the predictions and, 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 and many of the stories of the Bible. He's there. He's there so clearly. The scriptures bear witness of Jesus. Then, of course, those he ministered to, they became witnesses to Jesus. We read in uh, John chapter 4, verse 39, that was, you know, the passage where Jesus ministered to the, the woman at the well. Many some of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. Jesus just uncovered her life, her history, though he'd never met her. And, 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 and she was so amazed that she went and told all the people in the village and they came and they believed in Jesus. Also in connection with Lazarus and the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Therefore the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness as you would. They were there. I said, don't care what you say, don't care whether you believe him or not. We know what we saw. He raised this man that was dead four days, whose body was beginning to corrupt. And, uh, you know, he, he raised him from the dead. We saw it with our eyes. They bore witness. That's why we read that um, the Pharisees also wanted to kill Lazarus. They wanted to remove the evidence. Amen. Then the disciples... These were especially chosen to be his witnesses, to lay the foundation of the church. He says, you also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Amen. Now, we know the disciples, they, they, they were weak and faltering and, you know, they were up and down and uh, fearful and they all deserted Jesus when he was crucified. But when he was raised from the dead... And they saw the risen Christ. What a transformation. They were no longer afraid. They were no longer frightened. They were no longer cowering. They were bold, even though they were threatened. If you preach in that name again, we will kill you. They weren't afraid. See, friends, people will die for the truth. They won't die for a lie. They won't die for a hoax. Amen? But these men were totally transformed after they saw the resurrected Jesus Christ and saw the nail prints in his hands and so on. John who wrote this said, and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe. That's why Jesus, sorry, why John is writing this gospel so that people in his generation and every successive generation might have a foundation for their faith. Right at the end he said, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true and then of course jesus sent the holy spirit when he went back to heaven why to be a witness he said when the helper comes whom i shall send to you from the father the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father he will testify of me amen Friends, I don't know what you believe about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but I tell you this, if, 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 um, you know, if you look what the scripture says, and what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit is that he will bring the focus to Jesus and he will bear witness to him and testimony to him. Amen. 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 So let's come back to John as we just wind up here uh, this morning. He says he was not that light. John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light 
to every man coming into the world. Amen. This defines the character of preaching. This should be the aim of every preacher and every witness to get their hearers to look away from themselves to look to Jesus. Amen. You know, I just think it appears that some preachers are trying to build their own ministry, establish their name and build almost their kingdom. And that's, that's, that's going to crumble. Anything that's not focused on Jesus will crumble. Amen. That's a message. He is to preach Christ. Paul says, God forbid that I should preach anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. He is our message. He is the one we proclaim. And, and John said that. He said, you know, I've come to bear witness to the light. And, and, and you know, he was, he was eventually arrested and put in prison, waiting execution. All he wanted to know was, has he been pointing out the right man? And he sent to Jesus, you remember? Are you the one that should come or should we be looking for another one? Go and tell John what you've seen. The works that I do, they testify of me. Amen. Hallelujah. So we don't look to the preacher, you know, the, and, and the preacher doesn't build himself up. And we don't look to the preacher. I think, I think sometimes congregations look to preachers and even lift them up on a pedestal and something happens in their life, they fall over and then their faith is shattered because they listen to the preacher. Friends, whoever's standing at the front here or whoever you listen to, they're just, as we sang earlier on, a vessel, a clay pot that God has poured this treasure into that he might be made known. It's Jesus that is our message. So this is the message the Spirit of God will own. For Christ said of him, he shall glorify me. So John, so we can kind of wind up this morning. John said, I'm writing this so that you might believe. I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave a foundation for every one of you to believe when I go. And he called forth the witnesses. Amen. Jesus himself, the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Scriptures, John the Baptist, the works that he did. Amen. Those he ministered to, the disciples. He brings all these witnesses to testify that Jesus is the Son of God. But there's one other witness we haven't yet included. You. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, said Jesus, and you shall be witnesses to me. Or the NIV says, you shall be my witnesses. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You know, I, 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 the way I was brought up, or at least the impression I got when I heard testimonies was it had to be dramatic, it had to be, you know, something sensational. And, and it basically had to be about you. And I felt I didn't have a testimony like that, you know. I just believed in Jesus and God saved. That's our testimony. It's about him. It's not about you. It's about what he has done and what you are believing in. Amen. That's our testimony. And all we need to do is to be a witness. We're not responsible for results. That's not our responsibility. Just share about Jesus. Just share what you know about Jesus and that you put your trust in him and, and how your life has changed as a result of that. Amen. When I was um, coming back, or well, both flying to Kenya and coming back, you know, it's a long flight, a lot of hours in the air, and uh, thankfully they put on movies uh, to kill time. And uh, one of the movies I watched was a really old movie uh, from the 70s, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Remember that one? It's one of Steven Spielberg's earlier movies. And, uh, you know, I was intrigued by that phrase, close encounters of the third kind. What is that? And apparently there, there are different degrees of encountering UFOs, you know. The first is if you see one within a range of 150 meters or 500 feet, then that's a close encounter of the first kind. Now, you try to tell others that you saw that, you may even have a photograph, and many people try to, you know, explain it away and... Uh, say it was a mirage or it was this or that and so on. But, but you saw some evidence of a UFO, you think, okay? That's the first kind. But then the second kind is, you know, when, when, when there's a scorch mark on the earth, 
This thing has landed and left this scorch mark that cannot be explained by anything we know. And so that's a close encounter of the second kind. It's got nearer, but it's still not a personal encounter for you. But then there's the, the third kind, which is where the, this movie ends up, where these UFOs come to Earth and land and the aliens step outside and you've had a close encounter of the third kind face to face, okay? Now, you know, it's like that. I, I think about it, it's, it's a little bit like that as a Christian. You know, we, we, we have many evidences that kind of witness to Jesus. For, you know, we, the first kind is, like, you look at creation, just amazing, like we're saying, life itself. It's not an accident, it cannot be an accident. And, and, and you look at everything about creation, there is design. It's not an accident, there is careful design, and so there must be a designer. And, and you look at the, the heavens and the, you know, this universe and you think, there's a power behind all this, there's got to be. But that's, a, that's like a close encounter of the first kind, if you like. But then you might meet someone who has had an experience with God, who's, who's been born again, and you see their life has changed, but it's not for you, you've not had that experience, it's second hand to you, right? That's like a close encounter of the second kind. But then there comes that beautiful time when you hear the testimonies. And that's how we get saved. No one, no one else gets saved apart from hearing the gospel. It's the only way. It is the power of God under salvation. Amen? No, it's not miracles. It's not any of those things. It's hearing the gospel. And we heard the gospel. As left by the uh, apostles, the testimony, and then the Holy Spirit bore witness to that in our hearts, and we believed. And guess what? We had a close encounter of the third kind. We had our own personal experience with God. It began a personal relationship. I want to say if anybody's watching this who, who is not a believer, who is not a believer, you've heard the testimonies, the eightfold witness bearing testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. What's your response to that? He that believes has eternal life. If you put your trust in Jesus, who God sent into this world, gave abundant testimony to. If you put your trust in him, you will have eternal life. You can do it now. You can just say yes to Jesus. I believe you. And then just watch the miracle unfold. Watch God's light come into your life. Watch your life change and, and be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for the word of God that has been wonderfully inspired and preserved for us down through the ages. We thank you for the testimony that comes so clearly from your word. We don't know everything. There are many unanswered questions, but we know enough to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who stepped into humanity that he might die for the human race. And Lord, today we declare we believe in Jesus. We believe he is the Son of God. We believe he is our Savior. And we thank you that in believing that, we have life. So, Father, we give you all the praise and the glory, and we pray that you'll continue to bless this testimony from your word throughout the earth. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen.